Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimize Podcast. Today, I am thrilled to be chatting with Joe DeSena, founder of uh, the Spartan Race, author of three different books. We've covered two of them so far, Spartan Up and Spartan Fit. Yeah, you will soon have access to our notes on the Spartan Way as well. As you know, if you follow me and uh, what I'm up to these days, I am absolutely all in on Spartan Race. As I was telling Joe, I've, I've read a fair amount at this stage. I've been impacted by a lot of people intellectually and wisdom-wise. And I was just talking to my wife, Alexandra, about it before our interview. I'm not sure anyone has impacted me quite as much as Joe has, both um, energy-wise, athletic-wise. The Spartan races have truly been transformative for me, which is a thing we'll talk about today and that um, Joe says again and again with the 5 million people that have done Spartan races so far en route to his 100 million goal, but also entrepreneurially and in every other way. I just read the book and literally it's like, I just feel this call to be a better person. And um, Joe, I appreciate you, how all in you are to your commitment to embodying uh, the virtues of uh, the Spartan lifestyle um, and just who you are as a human being. So thank you for uh, being you and thank you for taking the time to chat today. Everybody listening, um, you are awesome. You probably you don't ever get any praise like that, but um, I have been seeing this guy that like does some little pieces on our books and um, I'm getting them sent to me from like all over the world. This guy is awesome. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't even know, by the way, when you hit me, when I was doing this podcast today, that you were the guy until I saw your face. And I'm like, oh, this is the guy. <laughs> so um, you should know that your stuff is in Singapore, um, Japan, Mexico. Um, folks are sending me your link saying, we follow this guy and he likes you, Joe. Wow. So that's, that's funny. Right on. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I've been, I've been. Not only the uh, the you know notes on or the videos on the books, but I've just been talking about it all the time. We've actually got seventeen little micro plus ones, and I kind of apologize. Yeah, I'm talking about Spartan again. Here we go. I've got a spear throw in my backyard. I've got a herc hoist. I've got a rope climb. I've got two wall traverses. My ceiling's decked out with your rig and twister, etc. Um, and again, so I appreciate your kind words, and I appreciate again just kind of the the. Um, I don't even know how to put it, but just the the catalyst you are as a human being and your organization is um, and the audacity of your vision and then the grit with which you've executed that vision. Um, it's transformed my life and and it's it's a family thing. And I, I'm, I sell it all the time, but I you and I were chatting about the fact that last weekend, my family, uh, my wife and two kids went to uh, the Spartan race here outside of L.A. I ran the competitive age group, guys, took a few minutes off, ran it again with my wife, who's a former All-American athlete and getting into it. Um, and then I took a few minutes and ran it with my six-year-old son, the half-mile version. And my 22-month-old would do it. She's got great, crazy great grip strength already, you know, but she's too young. But it's a family thing, you know, and your commitment to... Um, using obstacle courses as a physical metaphor for the challenges we all face in our lives and having people brush off the Dorito ch crumbs off their chest and <laughs> get off the couch and go get to work is just epic. So again, I listen, it's been a long um, time coming, so it, it wasn't it wasn't easy. And uh, I had a lot of self doubt along the way as to whether or not it was going to work. And was I crazy? And Everybody questioned it. And so it's pretty awesome to be in this place. But, you know, we can't rest on our laurels every single day. I've got to get a lot of people into the system signing up to pay for this machine that we built. Like, like now it's over two, it's like 275 events in 41 countries, right? So imagine knowing you've got to spend that money uh, putting on those events and we got to fill the bucket every day with a bunch of Looney Tunes like you that are willing that are willing to commit because, because life is easy. And, and it's a lot easier not signing up for the, you know what I mean? Like, like we're selling hardship and, and commitment and um, discipline and go to bed early and wake up early and don't drink the extra glass of wine and don't eat the cook. It's a hard sell. 
Right. It's never been more important to make the sell. And and I, I love the the economic risk you've taken. I mean, in one of your videos, six hundred grand, whether one person shows up or five thousand people show up, times two hundred and seventy five, that's not a small number. And the you know, the the again, just again, the audacity of your vision and the commitment you've made is astonishing. And then let's talk about the virtues. So, you know, the Spartan way, Spartan Up is all about just Spartan Up. It's a ph- phenomenal book, your first one. Spartan Fit is a little bit more on, okay, let's take it to the next level. So Spartan Up got me to do my first race and I did my first burpee after reading that, right? And now you've got me, as I told you, doing 100 a day, 40,000 a year, awesome all in, you know? And then Spartan Fit is about fitness and, and how to particularly train. I use your warm up every single day. I carry every other day I carry my fifty pound bag, sandbag, and then I alternate that with my fifty pound Spartan sandbag and my fifty pound bucket, right, up the first five minutes. So that was great for that. And then the Spartan Way is your newest book, which we're gonna focus on today, which is about virtue. In in my work I sum it, I, it all comes back to virtue. So I lean a little bit toward Athens vis-a-vis Sparta in terms of my intellectual orientation. But, you know, going to Aristotle, who told us the whole point of life, the summum bonum, is eudaimonia. It's not happiness, it's flourishing. It's good soul, right? And the way to get there is virtue, in a word, arete. So you breaking down the 10 Spartan virtues is what this book is all about and kind of the fuel, really, for your essence and who you are. So uh, I'm excited to chat about that. Some of these principles um, I struggled with for, I don't know, three or four years where I, I thought about anything hard I've done in my life, starting a business and, and you being a philosopher, I'd love your take on this, but starting a business, um, starting a family, um, running whatever I was running, 100 miles. Um, I, in my mind, I went down this road in each one of those challenges. And those roads uh, started in a place and ended in a place. And so I I would have these virtues on index cards and I'd say, well, this one comes first and that one. And literally for three or four years, I couldn't agree with myself as to what came in what order. And then finally uh, agreed and and wrote the book. So um, I'm psyched that at least one person read it. I'm psyched that (laughs) read this. That's awesome. Uh, well, let's, uh, we know many more have, and I'm excited to support many more in doing so. So 10 core virtues, um, you want to run through them or you want me to run through them real quick? Well, let's run through them and, and, um, you, you give me your take and I'll, and I'll tell you what I was thinking when we, when we came up with it, but, but knowing your true North or, or as Simon Sinek says, your why, right? And so for me, um, I struggled with this idea of when are you supposed to turn around? You know, this guy, Ed Visters, he's a, an American mountain climber, says getting to the top of the mountain is optional. Getting down is mandatory. And, um, you know, you've been in a lot of races. I've been in a lot of races. We've started businesses. You've got people that are in marriages. And, you know, is it okay to get divorced? Is it okay to quit the race? Is it okay to um, close the business? And, you know, if you if you just knew me from the outside, you just knew this Spartan brand, you'd say you never give up, you never quit. But yet Ed Vister says, right, getting down is optional. And so I struggled with like, when is it OK to quit? When, when should you turn around? And I've come to the conclusion, but I'd love your take on it, that it really depends on your true north. It depends on your why, because if you want to be the greatest dad, the greatest family man that ever lived, and you are within 100 yards of summiting Mount Everest in a terrible storm, you should probably turn around because dying is not an option, right? But if you're about to set the world record for climbing, and this is, you know, Guinness Book is there, and NBC is filming with helicopters, and I don't know, maybe you go for it because that's your true north, right? Um, You know, Leonidas and his 299 men, right? They, like, they stood their ground. Um, but if, if, and, but their whole life was being warriors, that was their true North. So, so I don't know, does that make sense to you? Yeah. And that's to, to bring a point to it on the, on the virtue, self-awareness is the virtue, right? And knowing your true North and you walk through, you know, so many different ways to arrive at that. Um, 
for me, what I felt was the, the self-awareness of kind of fast forwarding to the end of my life and, and thinking of the eulogy, you know, and, and what do I want to be remembered for? What's my, what's my legacy? And you have a way of, of um, independent of, you know, when you quit and whatnot, just, are you giving us all you got? Like that, that's probably more, perhaps what I get from you more than anything, you know, and just getting that clarity on what's your true deep why. And uh, in the note I did on, on your book, I talked about what some people call hell, <clears throat> which is right before you die, you meet the person you could have been cruises in the room and boom, there they are radiantly confident and just bouncing. And they're still alive because they did the little things you didn't do, you know, and here you are on your way out. There's hell. And so I think what I get out of it is the challenge to be that right now, you know, you know what you're capable of and are you actually living it? Um, and of course there will be the, the, the edge cases where you got to decide whether you, you know, this value or that value and the trade-offs you make, et cetera. Um, but that's kind of that's that's what I get, and why I think that was such an imperative and important first. Love that I've never heard that before. I love that that moment of hell. That is awesome. Yeah, I get nauseous every time I even think about that. That's you know? a wake up for all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is going back to the the whole Aristotle eudaimonia. He calls that ideal person the eudaimon, right? The good soul. So I named my soul. It's Optimus, you know, and Optimus is there every moment of every day asking me, are you, are you being your best? Are you stepping forward? Um, he lives in the shadows. He's right there. He's right there. He doesn't miss the thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right turn. What's that? He makes every right turn. He does everything right. He does. And he knows when you don't, you yeah. know, and this is, yeah. So that self-awareness, you know, of, of having the courage to actually be honest with yourself when you aren't stepping up on the big picture and then also moment to moment to moment. And and to your point, that's a hard sell. You know, I'm selling virtue. This is this is what I'm selling all day, every day. Virtue, virtue, virtue. It's a little different than the six pack on Instagram, you know. Um, that's yeah. But the exciting thing is it's the right sell, you know, and, and I know you know that and, and I see that and it's so... A lot of people that are morally correct and broke, and and want it, you know, and and you know, anti fragile wise, uh, good opportunity to uh, to serve a profound number of people, right? Sure. So, so then, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was just I was going to talk about commitment, right? Being committed, but but really committed. Um, I think about um, I, I spent some time in Japan, uh, Mount Hiai, with with the marathon monks and. Um, pretty committed like like they're doing uh, you know 900 days of marathons and and they carry a sword and a rope for those that, that don't know the story and if they decide to quit they got to kill themselves and you know you and I are not suggesting suicide but but like that level of commitment there's a great there's a you can google uh, the rap preacher and he tells this great story about a kid who wants to make money you've probably heard this and the rap preacher says, you want to make money, come meet me on the beach at 5 a.m. And the kid shows up and wear a suit or whatever. And he's like, I don't understand. I want to make money. And he, and he brings the guy out in the water. And the kid's thinking, I don't understand. I want to make money. What the hell am I doing on the beach when I'm in the water? Go further and further and further out. And finally, he holds him underwater. Right? And his kid's thinking, this guy's nuts. And he comes up and he's, and he's gasping for air. And he says, well, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, you're going to be successful, right? That's the lesson. And so that's the level of commitment we're talking about. No matter what you're going after, you want to be the best monk, you want to be the best mom, the best dad, the best endurance runner, you got to commit at that level. Um, you know, I'm sorry to just hog the airwaves here, but, but I, um, I started a bunch of businesses in Vermont and, and, uh, when I met my wife. And I had this idea that I would take away the struggle that I had when I was building a business. So in other words, I bought this general store, I fixed it up, I stocked it, and I was going to find an entrepreneur and just put them in and take away all that struggle. They wouldn't have a mortgage payment. Uh, they wouldn't have to worry about borrowing money to uh, stock the store. I'd even bring in customers, right? And I did the same thing with the wedding business, and I did the same thing with the farm. I got a tractor, I got cows, I got chickens, greenhouses. Took all the struggle away. They all failed because none of those people were committed, right? Like it's almost like 
this is counterintuitive, but like part of the reason I've been successful is because I've had no choice. The monks have no choice. <laughs> if they don't do the 900 days, they have to kill themselves, right? When you beg, borrow, and steal to run a business, like your back's against the wall, you have no choice. And so um, that's the kind of commitment we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, that's, and then even then though, you do, but you don't. And I think that's the, that's what I get out of you and your work is that it's the, you know, Mark Divine Navy SEAL, it's the King Leonidas, you know, in, in theory, they had choices, but they didn't because they were living to a higher value system. And they were right. committed to something bigger than themselves. And yeah. then you put in all the material, you know, um, all in this, I'm in the same position. I mean, I, I read your story about peak.com and, and laugh because, you know, I've raised you know, 10 million bucks just to finance my three businesses and raised 2 million for this venture four years in wasn't working. We were, you know, hitting, hitting our stride and doing okay, but I knew it would never be what I needed it to be. Blew it up, took it back to zero. And that just hurt. But my brother put basically his 401k in. There's no scenario. There's not even a remote possibility that he isn't not only seeing his money, but getting a great return. So there's that, that level of of um, commitment and it reminds me of a mentor of mine when I was 24 25 I started my first business we briefly started talking about called e-teams we built websites CMS systems for families in sports literally baseball wound up using it but there was a point when the we raised five million dollars won the business plan competition at UCLA I hired the CEO of Adidas to replace me as the CEO um, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we'd have these awesome drives from LAX when he'd fly in from Portland to my office, which was horrible in Westwood, right? And he told me right when the market crashed, the obvious, but it's easy to start something. It's not how you start something. It's how you finish it. And just that willingness to dig deep and to have the grit, which is another one of our principles, and to truly be committed um, is where it's at. And again, we can talk about that forever. But it's important for people listening, like, like, um, everybody listening wants to be successful at something, whether it's the marriage or, or business or uh, raising children. There's something they want to be successful at. These principles, these virtues, that, like you'll nail whatever you're like this. I didn't invent these. This has been around forever. Um, but if you don't master these, if you don't have a practice in these, uh, it's going to be tough. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And this gets back to our conversation we were having before that I want to get back to when we get offline, but just the support too, right? And just the doing it day in and day out. And this isn't an occasional thing. This isn't even a do a Spartan race and prove you can do something and then go back to your old lifestyle. This is about a, a ruthless commitment. And let's use that as a segue into, we're going to get off the virtue for a moment, but um, uh, <laughs> our, our, your friend Leo Tell us about your friend Leo. And I think of this because you use it as that metaphor for moment to moment commitment that is so good. Tell us about Leo. So Leo, I think, I think Leo started, um, Leo is a kettlebell. He's a, he's a 20 kg kettlebell that I've been carrying around for a long time. And um, I think it started because I don't know if you know this story. I had a guy who was 696 pounds who came through one of our races and I heard about him. And so I called him up. I got in touch with his office, the company he worked for Comcast, and I convinced them to release him for 18 months. And uh, I took him to the farm and I got him as committed as the monks in Japan. I took his wallet, I took his car keys and he was on lockdown. And we got this guy down to 200 and I want to, don't quote me, 60 something pounds, 69 or 65 pounds. And, um, and I asked him, it was a very simple um, program, hard, but simple. It was, uh, you're going to do 10 miles every morning. You're going to do 10 miles every night to walk. You've got all day. You're not working, right? I got to work. And you're going to carry this little 20 pound sandbag, which would go up in weight. And he was pissed off and I thought maybe it was aggressive and, and he was going to eat raw fruits and vegetables. And so I said, um, I'll tell you what, as you lose weight, I'll start carrying more and more weight because I wanted to be like um, a team member to him, right? And I got to a hundred pounds to him bag and, and I had to carry this thing in front. That was my deal. Couldn't go on my shoulders, right? And it was a bear. 
I mean, a hundred pound sandbag was a bear. And then so I was doing that for a while and I was getting, I was staying in shape. It was kind of awesome. And it sucked at the same time. And, um, my family and I were moving to Asia and I couldn't bring the sandbag. It just wasn't going to work. A matter of fact, I tried to bring the sandbag the day we were getting on the flight with the family and it went through the scanner and it had a bunch of metal BBs in it. That's how it was a hundred pounds. And, um, they rejected it. And so the guy that was dropping us off took the bag. And when I landed in Asia, I said to my wife, why don't you order a kettlebell for me? Uh, like a 20 pounder. I was tired of carrying a hundred pounds. And she ordered a 20 kg because we're in overseas. It was a mistake. And so that's how I ended up with this, this, this friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so the friend is, the friend is Leo, which is, uh, I assume you share what it's short for without people guessing it. Yeah. Leonidas, this is Leonidas and, um, and Leonidas, uh, I've lost a bunch of them. What happened unbeknownst to me, I just found out recently is all my flights between New York in Boston, I tend to uh, lose them. They they don't end up on the other side. So I thought either A, they're worried because of you know 9-11, or B, there's somebody uh, working back there that's a fitness nut that's been grabbing all my kettlebells. But one night, about a month ago, I decided to stay and wait in bag, baggage claim. And I was gonna make a stink. I'm not that kind of guy, but I decided <clears throat> I'm getting so annoyed and we waited and waited and I went back and forth with the lady and I said, this is ridiculous. It's been so many, you know, kettlebells and it's not big money. I wasn't even looking for the money back. I'm just frustrated. Well, it turns out they get stuck on the belt. <laughs> so, so the mechanic wanted to kill me because <laughs> they're, they're replacing these belts and trying to get the friggin. So I felt terrible. So, they, <laughs> so anyway, that's why I was losing a bunch of kettlebells. Carry on now, right? That's yeah. super yeah. funny. And to put it in perspective, Joe actually brings his kettlebell everywhere he goes. So he goes to a business meeting, he's got the kettlebell, boom, on the on the you know dining table at the restaurant. He's uh, flying, he brings it as that metaphor of your commitment. And, and life isn't easy, right? And you're willing to carry extra weight. You're willing to do the work to have the strength for two. Um, we talk a lot about another ancient idea of the etymology of the word hero. Um I didn't know what, what it meant. You know what it actually literally means, the word hero in ancient Greek? So it didn't mean tough guy or killer of bad guys. It meant protector. A hero was a protector. And the idea, this is Chris uh, McDougal shared this in Natural Born Heroes. And uh, it just blew me away. You know, this idea that a hero is, is a protector and a hero has strength for two and their secret weapon is love and compassion. And they're willing to do the work to have the strength for two. So when I see... You carrying that kettlebell, you know, and you challenging us to go out and do these races. That is why I'm so all in on this and why I'm so committed to supporting you in, in your cause. I, you know, I, don't, I don't have any brands that I associate with, but I'm now holding up a little, a little wristband and showing Joe in a little video chat here. I've got the only thing I have on my desk other than my water, whatever, is a little Spartan wristband on a beast, which is my preferred distance to remind me to be a beast, you know, and to be strong and, and to have that strength for two and to be to be a hero. So, um, again, I think that's ultimately what that's what my work is all about. Become the best version of you, which is what optimize literally means. Optimus equals best. Yeah. That's the eudaimon and that's the hero. Have that strength and you got to have it physically, which brings us back to our virtues here, right? So we've got, let me, let me run through them real quick. So everyone has a gestalt and then we'll have fun with a couple more of them and then get the book for more details. But self-awareness, commitment, passion, discipline, prioritization, grit, courage, optimism, integrity, and wholeness. If you had to pick your next favorite, which one would it be? I would say it depends. It depends. If you, if you ask me um, in business, I'm really good at prioritizing, right? Because you've got a million, I guess it's not just business. I guess it's family. I, it's everything, right? Your relationship, um, running 100 miles. I'm really good at quickly pushing to the back the white noise and the things that don't matter right now and focusing on the fire at hand. And, and I think uh, all of us could, could use more of that ability because I see so many people and you probably see so many people that get caught up in the things that don't matter, right? Like, like I'm thinking about like a race um, going across Alaska 
and I'm feeling a little blister in my foot. But there's 20 other things going on. There's a snowstorm coming in. We're deep, you know, waist deep in snow already. Um, our compass is not giving us the right reading. But like this blister is probably the most important thing to deal with right now. Because if this blister gets any bigger, it's going to stop the race. Right? Like we could be lost for a while. That's okay. We could deal with a snowstorm. That like, But I have an ability, um, and I think we should all um, practice this and get good at it at deciding and focusing on the thing that matters right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So what's the specific practice you recommend we think about? So I think, I think one is um, at the end of each day, uh, at least for a while or certain days a week, we should look and see the things we did today. Like, like keep track of what we did and analyze that and say to yourself, like, how many of those things were actually important? How many were just a complete waste of time. And I think when you reflect back and you analyze that, you start to quickly realize, um, oh my God, uh, I wasted 80% of my day. Actually, the thing to focus on was this thing, right? I think I'm, I'm really lucky because at a very young age, I ran a um, construction business and I had to, uh, we'd get home at 11 o'clock at night and we were exhausted because we started at five in the morning. And I quickly learned that I had to completely clean out the truck at 11 o'clock at night, clean the whole thing, restock it and get it ready for the morning. But that wasn't instinctual like that. But I learned that because the next day, if the truck wasn't cleaned and restocked and I drove 40 miles to get to a job site and I was missing some parts, I lost a thousand bucks. And for an 18 year old kid, that was like burning your hand and face on the stove. Right. And, and so, you do that for a decade and you quickly learn to focus on the stuff that matters. So I think, I think you got to reflect on your days. Um, and then I think you got to plan ahead. I think, I think the night before the Sunday night for the whole week, um, if you're not instinctually good at this and nobody's born with this, um, you got to look at your whole week and say like, what at the end of this week, what is the thing that really moves the needle? And then the third thing I'd say is, I love this blog. Check it out. Uh, will it make the boat go faster, right? Like, like, just ask yourself when you're doing something, like, is this moving me closer to the goal line? And so for us, we want to change 100 million lives. Hey, Joe, we want to go partner with this company. Well, is that partnership going to get us closer to changing 100 million lives? Okay, well, then we should really consider it, right? So review your days. Get way ahead and org you know, organize yourself way ahead. And then three, just ask yourself a simple question um, with every decision you make. Right on. Um, again, we can run a weekend workshop on that, but I love it. We'll leave it at that. First things first, second things not at all, as uh, Drucker would say, right? Um, again, uh, I don't know if we talked about this before or if we actually mentioned it in our, our recorded chat here, but um, Angela Duckworth describes you as a paragon of grit. And when I read that, um, I felt like that captured the essence of you perhaps better than anything else anyone could ever say. What does grit mean to you? And how do you strive to exemplify that in your life? You know, um, grit is that ability to stay pumped and motivated and happy, even when it looks like you're not getting to the finish line, right? When you're running a hundred miles, sorry to keep using this example. I remember the first hundred miles I ran this woman, Lisa Smith. She said, I said, how the hell are we going to do this? I've never run more than 30 something miles. She said, Joe, the first 70 is going to be easy. I said, how, like, I just couldn't even grasp it. How, I've never even run, I've never even run half of 70. And, um, and sure enough, she was right. At 70, the wheels fall off. But, but what's interesting, because I've run a bunch of them, is until you get to like 80, you're like, it's not, not even going to happen. I'm never getting to the finish line. This is ridiculous. I can't even believe I signed up for this thing. But a gritty person somehow stays pumped and motivated through that whole experience, right? A woman through pregnancy and giving birth, right? Extremely gritty right to the end. Um, a person running a bit, I mean, running a business, Elon Musk said, what did he say? He said, um, running a business like chewing glass and looking into the abyss. I said, he's missing that one part of the sentence, which is, well, people are throwing knives at you. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Like it's just that ability to have, my father used to say, you want to be an entrepreneur, you got to have the stomach for it. I don't know what that meant. I was with a guy recently, he said, um, somebody told him, when you're building a business, uh, beware, you're going to want to jump off a roof. And he said he was about eight months in and he called the guy and he said, hey, you told me that when I was building this business, I was going to jump off a roof. I want to tell you, uh, you were wrong. I want to jump off a roof every single day. <laughs> but it, that grit is that ability to like somehow smile through it, right? And the Spartans, by the way, they used humor. Remember in the movie 300, the arrows are coming over from the Persians. And they're like, well, I guess today we'll fight in the shade. The military does that all the time. They turn it into a, a humorous um, interaction to kind of get through the tough times. It's awesome. And I, I love that you love Pressfield and his Gates of Fire and all of his work. Uh, huge fan of him as well and inspired by that. And I love that line of, well, I guess we're going to be fighting in the shade today. Uh, yeah. What are some other how-to, you know, somehow? Like, what are the other hows that you've engaged in in your life to get through? To get through the tough times. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you've heard, and not to, not to use cliches, but like, how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. And I guess, again, these are not things you're born with, but I guess I just learned... I guess it's important for everybody to put themselves in a situation where you can't turn back. So what do I mean by that? So you have your wife, your girlfriend, your friend drop you off 40 miles from the house without, without money. You got to get home. And, and the rule is you can't take it over. You can't like no phone. You got to get home. Right. And you'll trudge and you'll force it. And maybe for you, it's not 40 miles. Maybe it's 20, whatever it is. Right. But put yourself in a situation where you've got to do something so outside your comfort zone. And what it does, it sets a new bar. And then once you've set a few of those bars, like doing the beast or the ultra beat, whatever it is, um, you start to be able to uh, reflect on those tough times and learn and realize, all right, just one foot in front of the other. I might not be the fastest. I'm eventually going to get there. Rain is not going to kill me. Like, right? Like, like. You just need something to be able to pull from, some memory. And so, um, unfortunately, you got to do it, right? And then, yeah. well, and this brings us back to the Spartan race. Because even for me, like the first one I signed up for, I nearly didn't show up. And you talk about how you got to get to the starting line. You'll know what the finish line is, the tagline, right? Um, and what you say when people ask you, well, why should, what, what do you get out of doing a Spartan race? Well, you'll know at the finish line, right? And it's different for everybody. But then you also make the point that the hardest thing is actually to get to the starting line. The first like five races I did, I nearly didn't do each of them. I had never, tr I hadn't done more than like my four mile, you know, three, four mile loop here on my mountain. So the beast was like three times, other than the super, which was eight, which was double what I had done. Then the beast, I'm like, I don't even know if I could do that. You know, it's up and down ski slopes. And for me, it was, it was resetting. And I know you know this, and this is why you do what you do, but it's that, it's that resetting of what's possible. I finished my first one and I'm like, really? I almost didn't do that? What else in my life have I almost not done? And then I went from... And I shared this with our community, but I did my first beast in the open division. I was like 1,270 out of 5,000 or whatever, right? And then the next six months later, I do it. Maybe it was a year later, I do it. And I'm in the age group, competitive guys, right? And I do it and I'm, I'm still pacing myself and I got a lot of training to do. And I'm, I'm in this one, it's non-qualifying or whatever, but I'm in the top 10 in the age group, you know, and I'm kind of stoked. And, and I look at my time, I would have been number 10 out of 500, 1270 to number 10, had I raced in the open division. And uh -huh. so I look at it, and my athletic career ended at, at age 12 when I was a four foot 11, 81 pound freshman in high school, you know? <laughs> so I look at this and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such the perfect metaphor for this latent potential that wasn't tapped. Where else in my life am I leaving so much on the table? And that's how I, what I've gotten at the finish line. And, um, Again, when you talk about being dropped off 40 miles from your house and coming down, make it easier. Go do a Spartan race. Go do a Spartan race. And the first obstacle is the story you're telling yourself about why you can't do it. My mother-in-law is 65 years old and she hammers them. She's awesome with my wife, you know. <laughs> Gives me tears in my eyes. She did one before I did one. I'm like, okay, if she's doing it, I'm doing it. Uh, yeah, it's just so awesome. Um, yeah. Well, we're up on our time that we had talked about. 
what have we not talked about that you want to make sure our community um, hears from you in terms of optimizing vis-a-vis -vis the Spartan virtues? I think um, I'll, give you, I'll give you some fresh off the presses uh, fun stuff that you'll really, really appreciate. I was in Sparta, uh, Greece, and for anybody out there listening, um, and I promise you I'm not selling you on this, our race in Sparta is unbelievable. Um, maybe it's more unbelievable for me because of the history there, but I don't think so. It's just incredible. I mean, you get to run through the ruins. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> you get, like, it's so unbelievable that we're in Sparta and, and, um, and, and there's little coffee shops along the way. So people are sitting, drinking coffee and they're hearing and they're seeing the runners go by. Um, anyway, I'm there and I'm talking to the preeminent Spartan professor, 75 years old, and he's done his whole life's work on ancient Sparta. And I'm like, um, give me some like tips, virtues, principles. What were they like? What were they into? Tell me from your perspective. And he said, number one, structure. And I said, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, this, their, their structure, their body, just kind of like a, a, a building structure, right? They felt that if you take care of the structure, like your life's going to be more efficient. Everything you do is going to be better. But first and foremost, you have to take care of this machine, this body. And um, all right, what's the second thing? And he said, you got to set up your personal life to take care of the structure. Put yourself in a position. So, so live in a healthy place. So whatever that meant to them in the ancient world, we could apply it to our current world. But you'd want to have friends that believe in that stuff, right? You, you'd want to live near a gym, um, have a water filter. I don't know, whatever those things mean that, that you're set up to, to be healthy. The third was make sure you're in a society where everybody, right? So have, like have friends that, that believe in that. Um, the fourth one was um, be holistic about it. So it's not, and you'll love this one, it's not just, um, it's not just, uh, weightlifting or it's not just running it's it's uh, poetry and, and math and dance and and be holistic about it right um don't take yourself too seriously and i think that's some of the humor like oh i guess we'll be fighting in the in the shade uh, today and the one that really got me was um we all get focused on um legacy and and leaving something behind and they believe that you shouldn't focus According to him, you shouldn't focus on that. You should focus on here and now and doing it as perfectly as you can and best as you can, like, like you said, um, for that shadow that's fun, right? Be the perfect person. And if you're the perfect person or as close as you can get um, to whatever that means, you're naturally going to leave a legacy. And like 2,800 years later, we're talking about them still, right? And it wasn't about money. It certainly wasn't about big uh, coliseums or anything that they built because there's nothing there. It's just a pile of rubble. Um, but we're still talking about them. Wow. So I thought that was interesting. That's super cool. And just, I saw that there was a race there, but you're saying it's now an annual kind of thing? It is our, uh, so don't ask me why I'm a glutton for punishment. I've created a three uh, championship series. So it's uh, Tahoe, the Beast Championship. It's um, Sparta, the trifecta championship. So you're going to do a trifecta that weekend in Sparta and you qualify by completing a trifecta throughout the calendar year. And then uh, our ultra championship, uh, as many laps as you could do in Iceland, which I think, again, you're hearing it first here, is moving to Sweden. And I'm going to, we have a million dollar purse. So it's kind of like the um, horse racing. What's it called? The uh, triple crown. The triple crown. Um, and so we created this and, um, we're going to actually pay down not just a winner. We're going to pay down a bunch of a bunch of places. So, you know, it's hard enough to create one championship. I created three. I don't know why I'm, I'm a psychopath. <laughs> uh, you're passionate, which is our third virtue we didn't get to. Yeah. So this is good. So for my own benefit here, you're saying you do a trifecta, qualify to go to Sparta to do a trifecta over the course of a weekend. Yes, but it gets better. I am working with the city of Sparta and might not come this year, but it's coming guaranteed to build a giant marble tablet. I mean, giant. And I am going to chisel the names in Sparta of the people that have completed the trifectas in Sparta. Wow. So you'll have that like forever. That is awesome. Right on. You know, get there moment by moment by moment. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. 
Yeah, we'll all sell it for you, and I'll continue to sell uh, people getting off their couch. We need entries for anything. I'll, 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 I'm easy, but I'll, like, I, it's not about the money. It's about just getting people out there. No, of course. Well, and our business is a public benefit corporation. So we're a C-corp with one paragraph added, which basically says I have a fiduciary responsibility as a CEO to honor all stakeholders. And money is important. I mean, this idea of, of using profits as the – you know, the the red blood cells. We don't live for the red blood cells, but we need red blood cells to live. Um, so just that conscious circulation. And, and um, again, I'm repeating myself. Um, this is, in my mind, your organization is so worth supporting. So um, thank you. Uh, obviously, Spartan.com. Go check it out. Anything else you want to you wanna leave us with? Uh, we got the book. We got the podcast. Um, I don't know how you get to the podcast. Spartan Up podcast. Uh, <laughs> and then my email is joe at spartan.com. Anybody could always email me. You're always invited to the farm in Vermont if you want to come. One time I invited uh, 3 million people on Facebook. My wife lost her mind. But, <laughs> but not that many people come. Like, like I, um, people I have to say are pretty respectful. Like, <laughs> like uh, they don't email me with silly things. Like everybody says, you put your email everywhere. People don't really bother me. Uh, and the emails I do get, I want to get. All right, man. Well, big hugs. Thank you. Thank you.